Go around, Captain. Go around. With the runway in sight, a passenger jet smashes down at catastrophic speed. Why did the crew go off the end of the runway? Was there a problem with the airplane? Hang on to the son of a bitch! A Delta flight crew battle a deadly storm during their final approach in Dallas. They didn't have any idea of the severity of what they were about to face. Speed! Oh, God, go around! And tragedy strikes in San Francisco when a Boeing 777 lands short. Hang on! How could a couple of highly trained, experienced pilots simply fly an airplane into the ground short of the runway? Landing is a routine operation, but also one of the most dangerous stages of flight. Investigators have to determine what went wrong when the safety of the runway was in sight. If you're not prepared to land the plane, you shouldn't do it. It's early morning on the Indonesian island of Java. A Boeing 737 flies high overhead. Visibility eight kilometers, 27,000 feet. 27,000. The crew of Garuda Flight 200 is preparing to land. There are 133 passengers on board this morning. They're nearing the end of a short flight from the Indonesian capital of Jakarta, 265 miles southeast to the city of Yogyakarta. The plane is 15 minutes from touchdown. OK, when we're cleared, we approach runway 9, course 088. Captain Mohamed Mawoto Komar has been with Garuda for 21 years. Approach flaps 40. Auto break two. As they near the airport, he briefs first officer Gagam Rachman on the final steps needed to get their plane on the ground. Understood. Approach briefing complete. Garuda 200, you're clear to approach runway 09er. Let me know when you have the runway in sight. Gear down. Gear down. They are now less than 3,000 feet above the ground. The runway is in sight. Flaps 15. But as the plane descends, passengers notice something isn't right. The plane is going very fast and is very low to the ground. Clear to land, two miles out. Oh, up. Too low. Rain. Whoa. Go around, Captain. Go around. Too low. Rain. Rain. Oh, up. Passengers are thrown violently as the plane bounces a second time. Even after a third impact, the plane isn't stopping. The 737 has come to a stop in a swampy rice field off the end of the runway. But the disaster isn't over. Inside the burning fuselage, passengers struggle to get out. And outside, firefighters battle to reach the swampy crash site. If the fuel tanks ignite, the plane could explode. Anytime you've got the possibility of fuel, you need fire suppression right there, right now, because you've got massive flames at 1,800 degrees, and you've got a lethal situation. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> 
with an exit door finally open, passengers make their escape. Of the 140 passengers and crew on board, 21 people are dead. Clearly, you knew that people were not going to survive this. It's almost a miracle that so many did survive. There's a variety of different scenarios that go with any kind of landing accident. So from the challenges of an investigator with regard to trying to piece these elements back together, why did the crew go off the end of the runway? Were they flying the approach properly? Was there a problem with the airplane? At the crash site, investigators from Indonesia's National Transportation Safety Committee, or NTSC, face the enormous task of determining what went wrong. They're joined by members of the Australian Transport Safety Bureau, including investigator Alan Stray. What do you got so far? We have to establish where did it touch down? Were there any runway marks? Did it bounce? Did it skid? Looks like they hit pretty hard. Investigators quickly discover gouges and shattered pieces of landing gear on the runway. Clear signs that the plane slammed down with unusual force. The nose wheel digging in and fracturing was indicative of a very hard G-force on that impact. More skid marks here. It's also clear that the plane hit the runway more than once. So, one, two, three, then off the end of the runway. What caused the pilots to perform such a dangerous landing? Investigators need to know what happened on board the aircraft. Thankfully, the plane's flight recorders are quickly recovered from the scorched wreckage. All right, let's get these to the lab. Without that data, we're screwed. While they wait for the flight data, investigators look into the mechanical systems of the 737. Was there a mechanical failure? Looking at the performance of the aircraft, was it physically possible for the aircraft to stop? The team focuses in on the systems used during landing, including the wing flaps. The flap system on a modern jetliner like a 737 create greater lift. And, and that means that we can approach an airport or we can take off from an airport with a much lower and safer airspeed. They inspect the mechanical rods, or jack screws, that move the flaps. We measured the screw jack extension to establish what the flap setting was. What they find is astonishing. Doesn't look like the flaps are all the way out. To provide enough lift on landing, the flaps of a 737 are usually extended step by step from zero all the way to 40 degrees as the plane slows and descends towards the runway. However, the jack screws show a flap setting of just five degrees, not nearly enough for a safe landing. We just could not believe that the aircraft would have landed with only five degrees. Was there a malfunction within the flap system that caused the terrifying landing? Investigators hope the data from the flight recorder will shed some light on how the plane was operating before the crash. We were able to get information about the flap settings, the speed on the approach, the thrust reverser deployment, the dynamics of the approach and landing itself. Pull up the data for the flaps, would you please? There. The flaps were set for five degrees. Never more than five degrees. The data confirms the flaps were not configured properly for landing. To hear an airplane that's been in an accident because of overrunning the runway had a flap setting of only five in a 737 is very disturbing. As they continue to review the data, Investigators discover the 737 was coming in for landing blazingly fast. Flight 200 hit the ground at over 250 miles an hour. More than 100 miles an hour faster than normal. We're not stopping! The speed of the aircraft on short final and on touchdown 
so excessive, there was no way it was going to stop. But why did the pilots touch down at such a catastrophically high speed? After a painstaking data recovery process, finally, investigators in Indonesia are able to listen to the cockpit voice recorder from Garuda Flight 200. Fortunately, the recorder specialists at the laboratories uh, a tenacious breed and they do not give up easily. They hope the recording will help explain why the pilots failed to configure the aircraft properly for landing. OK, let's hear it. OK, when we're cleared, we approach runway 9, course 088. What you're doing is listening for the atmosphere and the tone, the ambience, if you like, in the cockpit. Approach flaps 40, auto break 2. Approach briefing complete. The captain certainly doesn't sound stressed. Then, the first hint that something's wrong. Looks like we're not going to hit the glide slope. The plane is higher than it should be for this stage of the approach. Better get down a little faster. To land smoothly, Planes need to lose enough speed and altitude to descend gradually and meet the runway at a shallow angle. But Flight 200 is too high for a steady landing. He definitely has some work to do if he hopes to get on track. Check speed, flaps 15. Flaps 5. Captain is calling for flaps 15. Why is he saying flaps 5? Flaps 15. The captain repeatedly tells the first officer... Check speed, flaps 15. ...to increase the flaps. Check speed, flaps 15. But the first officer never moves them past five degrees. OK. First things first. Why did the first officer ignore the captain and leave the plane at flaps five? It's very perplexing. If you've got professional pilots, we can make mistakes. But usually, that's why we've got two people up there, so one catches the other. When investigators revisit the speed of the landing, they understand why the first officer was reluctant to increase the flap setting. Way too fast for flap 15. The plane is traveling 35 knots faster than is designed for flaps at 15 degrees. Wind drag could tear the flaps right off the wings if the flaps are extended past five degrees. The uh, first officer was exactly right in not putting them down. But why didn't the first officer say something? Tell the captain to slow down. It's very clear that the co-pilot should have said, Captain, I got the airplane. But what it tells me here is that this co-pilot did not feel that he could speak up one way or another. The captain's behavior continues to stun investigators. Landing checklist completed, right? Landing checklist? Well, there were 15 ground proximity uh, alerts and warnings during that final stage of the approach. When a crew member hears that, there should be instant action. But instead of reacting, the captain becomes fixated on the landing checklist. Stray and his team begin to question the quality of the crew's training. Fixation is when we are focused on uh, completing a task to the exclusion of other things that may be going on around us. Investigators theorize that the captain is completely fixated on descending to the proper altitude. Landing checklist completed, right? In the case of a pilot fixating on a runway, he or she can blank out the rest of the advice, the ground proximity warning system, everything. Pilot training is designed to combat fixation, ensuring that pilots in a crisis situation can break the spell and take in the information they need. Better training might have helped the first officer overcome his reluctance to correct the captain's mistake. Oh, go around, captain. Go around. I think checklist completed, right? Without question, if the captain wasn't going to respond by going around, which is what he should have done instantly and in hearing whoop whoop pull up, uh, the co-pilot should have said, I've got it, and done the same thing.
In 2008, Captain Marwoto Komar faced charges and was found guilty of negligence, but the conviction was overturned on appeal. In their final report, investigators call for improved pilot training with added focus on approach and landing procedures. In the aftermath of the Garuda 200 disaster, the airline overhauls its training and safety protocols, and today it is a safer airline than it's ever been. The takeaway is that the organization has a responsibility to provide the pilots with the best available training, flying the best available equipment, and then having a process to ensure that even when no one's looking, they're doing the right thing. But sometimes, even the best trained pilots can be taken by surprise on landing when faced with an unpredictable force of nature. It's a scorching hot day at Dallas-Fort Worth International Airport with the temperature reaching 101 degrees Fahrenheit. The intense heat triggers thunderstorms that surround the airport. Delta Airlines Flight 191 heads in for landing at DFW. Weather 6,000 scattered, 21,000 scattered, visibility 10, temperature 101, wind calm. 101? 101 degrees, yes sir. Captain Ed Connors and First Officer Rudy Price are two of Delta Airlines' most experienced pilots. Second Officer Nick Nasik is one of Delta's most highly regarded flight engineers. They're flying a six-year-old L-1011 TriStar. There are 152 passengers and 11 crew members on board. Ladies and gentlemen, we are starting our approach to DFW. The crew begins their final descent into the Dallas-Fort Worth area. Attention all aircraft listening. There's a little rain shower just north of the airport. While continuing with their approach procedures, First Officer Price notices the upcoming storm. We're going to get our airplane washed. Less than six miles from the runway, the controller tells the crew to expect a stiff but manageable crosswind of up to 15 knots. Tower, Delta 191 Heavy, out here in the rain, feels good. First Officer Price is at the controls. He realizes the storm is more than just a little rain. There's lightning coming out of that one. Where? Right ahead of us. Thousand feet. I'll call him out to you. All right. One minute away from landing, Price carefully guides the aircraft towards the runway. Without warning, the intensity of the storm increases. Driving rain pounds the L-1011. All of a sudden, their airspeed picks up. Watch your speed. Price needs to slow the plane down so they don't overshoot the runway. They're only 600 feet off the ground. There it is. Suddenly, the plane drops sharply. It's as though an invisible force is pushing it to the ground. Push it up. Push it way up. Way up. Way up. Way up. The pilot's efforts are futile. One mile short of the runway, the plane plows into a field, traveling more than 200 miles an hour. At that moment, the controller catches sight of Delta 191. He's gonna crash! Delta, go around! wheeled into the tank in just an instant and then of course there was a wall of fire
In the tower, it's just quiet, and you just sit there, stunned, wishing you could do anything to take it back. When firefighters and rescue workers arrive, they discover 27 people have survived. But Captain Connors, First Officer Price, and Second Officer Nasik are killed, along with five other crew members and a devastating 128 passengers. I was on a Delta flight behind that flight. You could see this horrific fire and burning wreckage just about the plane window. And we came into the gate where that plane was supposed to have come. And at that time, families could go to the gates. It was a sight I will never forget. Investigators from the National Transportation Safety Board, or NTSB, arrive at Dallas-Fort Worth determined to find the cause. One of our field investigators would have been on scene trying to locate the flight data recorder and the cockpit voice recorder, which is, um, uh, you know, a very important part of the investigation. Thankfully, both flight recorders are recovered quickly and immediately sent for analysis. Investigators hope the data will reveal what caused Flight 191 to crash into a water tank off the end of the runway. This flight data recorder gave us several parameters we didn't have before. Engine power, uh, longitudinal acceleration, and those parameters really enabled us to do a more in-depth analysis. The device also records external elements like temperature, wind speed, altitude, and air pressure. When they review the data, investigators discover an alarming weather pattern logged on the recorder. Then it shifts to a downdraft. In a matter of seconds, the plane is hit with three strong winds from the front, above, and then behind. There you have it. Bud Lehner immediately recognizes the weather pattern. The plane flew through a microburst. A microburst is a violent shaft of air falling from a storm cloud. On the day of the crash, it had been extremely hot and hot air rises. When that hot air meets the cold, moist air in the storm clouds, it cools instantly and rushes violently back to Earth. If you're at the kitchen sink and you turn on the water and it goes straight down and it splashes out in all directions. And that's kind of what a microburst is, except that it is extremely bad news if you're an airplane flying through it at low altitude. The plane first faces a strong headwind, which lifts the plane skyward. Then it's hit by a downdraft, slamming it towards the ground. Finally, the microburst delivers its most dangerous punch, the tailwind. And you would get a rapid descent, a loss of lift, and a rapid descent towards the ground, and easily crash the airplane. It's clear that the 136 people on Flight 191 are the latest victims of the intense weather phenomenon. Unbelievable. But one mystery still remains. Altimeters. How did such an experienced crew fall victim to a storm? You're in good shape. They were all trained to overcome. When NTSB investigators compare the actions of Flight 191's pilots to the force of the microburst, Thousand feet. they uncover details of a fight to the death. I'll call them out to you. A fight that the Delta pilots almost won. Watch your speed. The increase in airspeed from the headwind prompts First Officer Price to reduce power to his engines. Power he'll desperately need in just a few seconds. You're going to lose it all of a sudden. There it is. The captain knew the characteristics of a microburst. He'd obviously been given an introduction to wind shear and microburst uh, characteristics in his flight training. But when Connors and Price are hit with the tailwind, there is very little they can do. 
Only 500 feet off the ground, they have insufficient speed and altitude with which to maneuver. Push it up! Way up! Then suddenly, the microburst delivers another blow, a fierce crosswind that forces their plane to bank dangerously to the right. Hang on, oh, son of a bitch! Combined with the other winds, the crew is defenseless. Toga! Toga! Toga is take off go around mode, plus abandon the approach. We're no longer going to try to, to land this airplane. The skill and experience of the pilots are no match for this fierce microburst. It's too big, its winds too powerful and unpredictable. Making matters worse, investigators discover the storm at the foot of the runway arrives virtually unannounced. Once trained weather observers see it on the radar, it's too late to warn the crew of Delta 191. It's small, it's the length of a runway, roughly, and it doesn't last very long. So it's something that can happen so quickly that many accidents have occurred because nobody knew it was there. Investigators conclude that the Delta crash was caused by the pilot's decision to continue their approach into the storm. A decision that was made because the crew wasn't warned about the hazard. After the crash of Delta 191, the Federal Aviation Authority installed terminal Doppler weather radar at high-risk airports, including Dallas-Fort Worth. Doppler radar detects the direction and speed of precipitation and wind flow. Doppler radar, which is on the ground, is incredibly effective in detecting microbursts. In fact, it can detect about 98% of a microburst. Even though we've learned a lot of information from accidents involving thunderstorms, things can still go wrong on a clear and sunny day, only feet from the runway. Ladies and gentlemen, this is your captain speaking. We hope you had a pleasant flight. We'll be on the ground in about 30 minutes. Asiana Flight 214 is nearing the end of an overnight flight from Seoul, Korea to San Francisco. The Boeing 777 is carrying 291 passengers and 16 crew members. Is that the Golden Gate? Captain Lee Kang Kook takes in the sights as he guides the plane towards the airport. Golden Gate's over there. That bridge goes to Oakland. Ah, OK. Lee Young Min, also a captain, is serving as first officer today. Runway in sight. Gear down, sir. Gear down. In the cabin, the flight attendants prepare passengers for landing. Asiana 214 Heavy, runway 28 left, cleared to land. Landing checklist complete, clear to land. On glide path. Check. The plane is less than a minute from the runway when a passenger notices something alarming. There's a small pier that extends out of the runway, and I'm like, wow, we're very low. In the cockpit, speed! A crisis hits. I got control. Oh, God, go around! The captain pulls up the nose and tries to climb. Just wondering how it's going to end, how it's going to stop, and when it's going to stop. In the cockpit, the pilots have survived, but they have no idea of the extent of the damage. The brutal impact has torn the tail off the body of the plane. Control, come in. It's Asiana 214. 
Initiating evacuation checklist. We need help out here. Asiana 214 Heavy, emergency vehicles are responding. Oh my god, that's scary. Eyewitness video captures the dramatic scene as hundreds of people flee the cabin from only a few exits. Come on, get out. Asiana Flight 214 has crashed on one of the airport's busiest runways. Nearly 50 people are seriously injured. Six were thrown out of the back of the plane when the tail broke off. Two of them are dead. The challenges in the Asiana 214 investigation were myriad. You would think, oh, OK, most everyone survived. This shouldn't be a problematic investigation. But it was. Investigators at the National Transportation Safety Board quickly pulled together a team. Senior investigator Bill English leads the high-profile investigation. Everyone's on standby, as of right now. So the 777 had been in service for about 20 years at the time of this accident. And this was the first fatal accident of a 777 in that entire time. The investigators arrive at the horrific crash site the following morning. Before searching the scorched wreckage, they equip themselves with protective gear to shield them from the toxic fumes. OK, here we go. For NTSB investigator Roger Cox, the hunt for evidence is worth the risk. It was a tricky accident site. Uh, we had to be properly garbed up to make sure that we weren't affected too much by the dangerous wreckage that was there. Cox gathers the pilot's charts and personal effects hoping to find clues about what the pilots were doing in the final stages of the flight. That's everything I could find. Many of the documents are in Korean. They'll need to be translated before they can be fully analyzed. Meanwhile, at NDSB headquarters, photos of the crash zone provide investigators with a crucial lead. Where it impacted on the rocks of the seawall, pretty much tells us it was too low. It landed well short of where it should have. The team hopes the data recovered from the 777's flight recorders will help explain why the plane crashed into the seawall. We were able to see all the basic things, like airspeed, altitude, the configuration of the airplane. We were also able to see all the inputs that the crew made. English carefully plots the data. Most of it looks completely normal. But then he spots something unexpected. This is where they bring it back to idle. One minute before the crash, engine power suddenly drops to idle. Right here. <clears throat> the sudden change in power settings makes no sense. Normally, the last moments of flight are when pilots need more power to overcome drag from the landing gear and wing flaps. And data from earlier in the flight shows the engines were functioning properly. We could see that the engines were making proper power all the way through the approach. The question now, what was the crew doing to control engine power in the critical final moments of flight? Speed. How did the pilots operate the airplane? Why did they do what they did that got the airplane too low? Three, three. Investigators turned their focus squarely on the actions of the pilots. You're down, sir. Understanding every nuance of the cockpit voice recording is crucial. They listen as the pilots prepare for a visual approach and landing. Missed approach, 3,000 feet. Landing checklist complete. Clear to land. On glide path. They combine what they hear with the data from the flight recorder that shows how the pilots were manipulating the controls. It seems a little high. As the crew nears the runway, the recording hints at the first sign of trouble. The rate of descent is too slow. They risk overshooting the runway. 
I will descend more. What the recording reveals next is stunning. To speed up the rate of descent, the captain switches the autopilot to flight level change mode, but he makes a dangerous mistake. He made an entry to the autopilot that at first actually made the airplane climb. Obviously, he didn't want to do that. Instead of descending, the new mode instructs the plane to climb to its preset go-around altitude of 3,000 feet. The autopilot mode switches here. Starts all the confusion. The pilot flying is supposed to actually select things with the auto flight system and call out what he's doing, and the pilot monitoring is supposed to verify that the change has actually occurred. No call outs. How's anyone supposed to know what he's doing? To bring his plane back down, the captain immediately pulls the throttles back to idle, stripping the plane of crucial airspeed they need for landing. It's low. Investigators now understand how the engines got to idle. Yeah. But why would an experienced captain make the mistake of leaving them there? Oh, oh God. Go around. And why did the crew not notice they were dangerously low until it was too late? NTSB investigators are anxious to interview the pilot who was flying Asiana Flight 214 when it crashed onto a San Francisco runway. I'll try to help if I can. The captain explains he was worried about landing in San Francisco. I was a bit nervous. On the day of the crash, the electronic runway equipment designed to help guide pilots in for landing was down. I thought that was very unusual coming from an experienced pilot because no one really needs an electronic glide slope on a clear day to be able to land an airplane. It's a fundamental skill. Other pilots are making that landing. I thought I should be able to make it too. Why did he not ask the other guy for help? I think he just didn't want to admit the weakness. It's low. The captain tells investigators he doesn't understand why the plane didn't have enough power on landing. I know I made some mistakes, but I, I was certain that the auto throttle would control the speed. Like other modern jets, the 777 can automatically increase or decrease engine power through a system known as the auto throttle. He was confident the auto throttle was actually going to take care of speed for him. That the auto throttles would wake up, advance the thrust, and keep them safe. But investigators discover the auto throttle never corrected the speed. Oh, go out. Did the critical automated system fail in flight? When they conduct an exhaustive search of the plane's computerized functions, the team makes a surprising discovery. We could see some strange things happening with automation inputs while that airplane was on short final. When they replicate the sequence of inputs made by the captain, including changing the autopilot mode and then reducing the thrust, Bingo. That does it. The unusual combination of commands switches off the 777's auto throttle system, leaving the engines at idle. By doing that, that sent the signal to the auto throttle system that he wanted control of the power. So at that point, in effect, the airplane was basically just gliding. Investigators finally understand why the auto throttle did not re-engage and boost engine thrust on landing. Oh, God. Go around. But it doesn't explain why the captain was so uncertain about autopilot function and why the crew was so slow to react. 22,000 hours between them. You'd think they'd notice the speed. The translated documents retrieved from the cockpit provide some crucial answers. They reveal that Captain Lee Kang Kook was training on the Boeing 777. Is that the Golden Gate? After flying the Airbus A320, an aircraft with a very different style of automation. 
Check. He was a little bit stressed because it was a training flight and he was being monitored by this more senior pilot. But why did the experienced first officer wait until it was too late before taking control of the plane? Oh, oh. I got control. If he had intervened sooner, positive rate, he would almost certainly have prevented the accident. When they continue looking through company records, investigators discover the first officer had never before supervised a training flight like this one. Slow. His inexperience most likely led him to wait too long. Speed! Before taking over the controls. In their final report on the crash of Asiana 214, investigators list pilot error as the probable cause. But they also cite the complexities of the automation system as a contributing factor. I am not confident that the majority of pilots, 777 pilots at the time, would have been able to predict the modes that the airplane would end up in. The report calls for better pilot training, more intuitive designs of aircraft automation, and better cockpit alarms to warn pilots if their speed gets too low. Modern jets are very, very, very efficient, which means that they're hard to slow down. So getting the airplane on the proper speed is one of the biggest challenges that jet pilots face. If pilots aren't prepared when the runway is in sight, a routine landing can quickly become a tragedy. A stabilized approach says, I know we can make it. If you're a pilot and you ever say, I think we can make it, you better be doing a go round, because those are the last words I've heard on so many cockpit bush recordings. Nothing's working. A confused John F. Kennedy Jr. is lost on his way to Martha's Vineyard. Disorientation can quickly lead to the airplane getting into an uncontrollable situation. High over the Red Sea, a pilot can't understand why his passenger jet is plummeting towards the water. Red top off, red top off. Over a dark ocean without a defined visual horizon, the pilot may not be able to perceive whether he was flying up, down, left, or right. Pull up! Pull up! And off the coast of Indonesia. Don't turn it! This is our heading! A Boeing 737 flies off course. We're going to get lost if it stays like this. In all of these cases, we see pilots disoriented as to which way's right side up. It's a terrifying cause of airplane accidents. A pilot lost in space. It's a warm summer evening at Essex County Airport. Less than an hour from the busy streets of Manhattan, the small airfield serves many of New York's wealthy citizens. Preparing to pilot his own plane, a man who in many ways is the elite of the elite, John F. Kennedy Jr. He was breathtakingly handsome. He was such a crown prince, people kept waiting for the moment when he would run for office publicly. Kennedy is waiting for Carolyn Bassett, his wife of three years, to arrive. Also hitching a ride on Kennedy's plane is his sister-in-law, Lauren Bassett. At 8.20 p.m., Carolyn arrives, two hours late. All right, ladies, hop in. I just have to do a walk around, and then we can get going. Though John F. Kennedy Jr. has had his pilot's license for more than a year, he hasn't flown solo since breaking his ankle six weeks ago. Still limping, he makes a final pre-flight check of his new plane, a Piper Saratoga. John plans to drop Lauren off at Martha's Vineyard and continue on with his wife to the Kennedy family compound in Hyannis Port, Massachusetts. Seatbelts on, please. All right, uh, battery 
on, fuel pump on, and propeller is uh, clear. At 8.40 p.m., more than two hours behind schedule, the flight gets underway. 75 knots. Oh, yeah. Like many private pilots, Kennedy is flying under visual flight rules, or VFR. You stay clear of clouds. You have to have good visibility. You're always looking outside, able to see the horizon, and orient the airplane using your visual cues. Kennedy cruises at just 5,500 feet, a typical altitude for small planes. Around 9.30 p.m., he leaves the mainland coast behind. Just leave a Montauk over there. I don't see a thing. His flight path was following the coast, so he would want to go south over the Long Island Sound to line up and set up for a long straight end for the runway. He expects to reach their first destination in about half an hour. We'll have you on the ground by 10 for sure. But by 10 o'clock. Martha's Vineyard Tower, airport security here. The air traffic controller at Martha's Vineyard Airport has had no contact with Kennedy's plane. Any word on that flight? Uh, negative. I haven't been notified of that arrival. Around Martha's Vineyard, weather can change quickly. And overdue flights are not uncommon. But as the hours pass, with no sign of the Piper Saratoga, a chilling reality sets in. John F. Kennedy Jr., his wife and sister-in-law, have vanished without a trace. The Coast Guard launches a search for John F. Kennedy Jr.'s Piper Saratoga. At first light, the US military and local law enforcement agencies join the search effort. The scale of the effort to search for the aircraft, it was massive. This was JFK Jr., and it, it captured the eyes of the country and the world. News that one of America's favorite sons is missing stuns the nation. We watched this adorable little child playing in the Oval Office. We watched him, of course, at that one terribly tragic and sad moment when the small child in a little short knee coat saluted his father's casket as it came by. The public wants answers. It seems like every news, major news organization was, had a presence in our parking lot. With no aircraft to examine, Jeff Gazzetti. Hey, Jeff Gazzetti. From the National Transportation Safety Board, compiles data from coastal radar stations to build a picture of how the plane was flying. OK, ready when you are. We always consider recorded radar data as a poor man's black box. It's a way to get some information in regards to the flight path, the airspeed, the altitude, and that was very helpful in this investigation. But the radar information leaves investigators perplexed. He suddenly starts heading away from Martha's Vineyard. Why is he flying in the wrong direction? About 30 miles from Martha's Vineyard, the plane makes a series of unusual maneuvers. You know, he's flying like someone who can't control the plane. The pattern that was indicated by the radar was quite unusual for a normal type of descent and approach to an airport. We don't know at that point exactly why. Finally, four days after Kennedy's plane goes missing, the investigation catches a giant break. Today, uh, we were able to bring closure to uh, two families, and, and, and I think that we realize is very important. US Navy divers locate the sunken wreckage and the bodies. 75% of Kennedy's Piper Saratoga is recovered from the ocean floor the and sent to a hangar for detailed analysis. Because the small plane was not required to carry flight recorders. Each and every piece, no matter how small, we need to know where it was found. Investigators will have to uncover the story behind this crash by interpreting the clues imprinted on the crumpled debris. 
I want to see every piece. We start at the wing tips, we work our way in. First, the team examines and tests the wreckage for any signs of a malfunction. Their efforts reveal that at the moment the plane hit the water, The aileron cables also seem fine. The engine, the flight controls, and the instruments were working normally. We found no evidence of any kind of pre-impact mechanical malfunction. The focus now shifts from the plane to the pilot. Investigators wonder, did John F. Kennedy Jr. lose control of his plane? Over 300 flight hours. He wasn't a total rookie. He had a fair number of flight hours under his belt. They check Kennedy's training records to learn all they can about his experience as a pilot. So what did he learn in 300 hours? I'd like to try a few ILS approaches again today. They discover that Kennedy had been taking lessons on and off for 17 years, but he had relatively little experience flying on his own. He's only qualified for visual flying. He hadn't finished his training for instrument-only flights. Investigators also discover that Kennedy was still working towards his instrument rating, a crucial qualification for flying at night or in bad weather, using only the flight instruments as a guide. Instrument flight is one of the hardest ratings to get when you're moving up through your licenses and ratings. And it involves flying without looking outside the aircraft so that when you're in clouds, you can maintain control of the aircraft. So he wasn't ready to fly if he couldn't see. So could he see or not? Investigators look at Kennedy's activities in the hours before the flight. Computer records reveal that he checked the weather online at 6.34 p.m. At that time, it was a clear day with good visibility. Any word from your sister? No, stuck in traffic, I guess. No, it's Friday. I told her it was going to be jammed. But they took off two hours later than planned. By that time, weather conditions over the ocean were deteriorating, with fog making it hard to see the horizon. Starting to get a bit sucked in. Hope it clears up for the weekend. Suddenly, Kennedy found himself flying at night in bad weather, both conditions he wasn't trained for. Was Kennedy lost in a cloudy haze before his plane went down? What the hell? John? What are you doing? Investigators now need to know what was happening in the cockpit. As John F. Kennedy Jr. flew his plane into worsening conditions. Not a great night for this guy to be flying. Weather plays an immense role in all aviation accidents, even the ones that you might not think it would. If Kennedy was concerned about weather, he could have been getting updates during the flight. 127.25. To get accurate information, investigators know he would have tuned his radio to the weather transmission from Martha's Vineyard. The radio from Kennedy's plane is among the many parts salvaged from the ocean, and it's tuned to 127.25, the wrong frequency. 126.25. He was off by one digit. Investigators now know for certain that Kennedy wasn't receiving the weather updates he needed. It's a revealing discovery. The team begins piecing together a likely scenario to explain Kennedy's tragic end. It started after he cleared New York. As he heads up the coast towards Long Island, night falls and visibility decreases. Visibility was bad, and it's getting worse. He starts his descent. But Kennedy isn't properly trained to fly solo in these dangerous conditions. As he headed out over the water, and all those lights were behind him, all that visual reference was gone. It's possible that Kennedy decides to check the weather station in preparation for landing. He looks away from his instruments for like a second. 
127.25. Remember, his frequency was off. Maybe he was trying to tune the radio. He might look to see if the frequency had changed. Still nothing. While all of that's going on, it's quite easy for the airplane to slip into a little bit of a bank one direction or another. Investigators now believe that the disorientating effects of the dark, hazy night begin to affect Kennedy's sense of space. If you're in a turn for an extended period of time, your inner ear can feel a reverse of the turn, and you can get, become spatially disoriented very easily. What the? That can't be. When he looks back, his instruments are telling him one thing, his sense is another. You have to be well trained to disregard what your brain is saying and look at your instruments, work on your scan, and fly by your instruments. What the hell? John? Just wait. Come on. Level off. What are you doing? Climb. Once he becomes disoriented, Kennedy is too inexperienced to believe his instruments, no matter what his senses are telling him. Nothing's working. He may not have even have known what type of unusual attitude he was in and that he was about to hit the water. So it's the only thing that fits. Spatial disorientation. You're really left with the, the gaping possibility that was always there, which was the classic case of spatial disorientation which unfortunately has killed so many pilots. Lost in the skies, Kennedy fights to keep his plane airborne. But he can't. Investigators conclude that Kennedy's tragic crash was caused by his inexperience flying in confusing conditions. That is one sorry flight path. Textbook disorientation. I don't think the public wanted to accept sort of pilot error as the cause. Losing him was one thing, but losing him essentially to his own mistake made it much worse. Research shows that spatial disorientation is a factor in 15% of all accidents. And as one of the most significant hazards to air safety, even the most experienced pilots are susceptible to this deadly confusion. Five years later, another crew experiences spatial disorientation when their passenger jet from Egypt. I was at a loss to understand how a flight crew with this level of experience would end up here. Mysteriously crashes into the Red Sea. Sharm El Sheikh, Egypt. It's a city perched on the Red Sea. Former Egyptian Air Force pilot Kader Abdullah is now a highly respected captain with Flash Airlines. Morning. Good morning, sir. His first officer today is Amir El Shafi. Ashraf Abdel Hamid is the third member of the crew, training as a first officer. Visibility six kilometers. Clouds and sky clear. They're piloting an early morning flight to Paris. In all, 148 passengers and crew settle into their seats aboard Flash Airlines Flight 604. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. On behalf of Captain Kader and his entire crew, we welcome you on board Flash Airlines Boeing 737-300. It's still hours before dawn when the plane lifts off. The Flash Airlines flight will head out over the Red Sea before turning towards Cairo. The jet climbs through a moonless, pitch black night. The ascent after takeoff is going well. Then, out of nowhere, the simple turn over the Red Sea see what the aircraft just did takes a bizarre twist captain Kader doesn't like the way his plane is behaving wow. 
aircraft is turning right. Turning right? How turning right? The plane is supposed to be turning left on its way to Cairo. Instead, it's turning in the opposite direction. The captain tries to get his plane back on course, but his situation just gets worse. Autopilot. Autopilot in command. Autopilot. Autopilot. But the autopilot doesn't work. Just minutes after takeoff, the plane is out of control. The 737 is now flying almost completely on its side. And gains speed as it spirals towards the Red Sea. The enormous G-forces make it difficult for Captain Abdullah to fly. Three minutes after Flash Airlines Flight 604 takes off. The plane disappears into the Red Sea. By the time the sun rises, the crash site is found. But there's little rescuers can do. 148 people are dead. There are no survivors. Egyptian, French and American teams join forces to investigate the crash. The light debris scattered on the surface of the Red Sea gives them their first clue. There was very, very few pieces and all located in a very small area. So this indicated that the plane was intact and went into the water intact. The debris pattern rules out an onboard explosion or breakup mid-flight. To learn more, investigators must recover the wreckage and black boxes currently thousands of feet underwater. Whenever an airplane crashes into the water, there's always a fear by investigators that the cockpit voice recorder and the flight data recorder may not be recovered. Without them, could make the investigation process very, very difficult. Finally, after an exhaustive search, a breakthrough. The black boxes are recovered by a remotely operated sub. Investigators now have some hard evidence. In Cairo, the multinational investigation team examines the critical devices. They mine the data from both boxes to recreate the final minutes of the doomed plane. To depict the path of the aircraft, we created an animation based on the data we got and from radar. The simulation paints a devastating picture. Shortly after takeoff, the plane begins heading left, just as it was supposed to. But then it quickly starts banking in the other direction. The cockpit voice recorder shows that the turn catches the captain off guard. Turning right, sir. How turning right? The pilots were experiencing definitely some kind of an abnormality, a problem that they could not understand. Digging deeper into the flight data recorder, investigators discover something peculiar. We believe from the data we, we are looking at in the flight data recorder that there is a very high possibility that the plane was tending to turn to the right by itself. Data also reveals that before the plane's bizarre turn to the right, three things seem to happen at the same time. The plane ends its left turn early. Its nose rises, and the airspeed drops. But shockingly, the captain says nothing. In fact, he seems completely unaware of the dramatic changes to his flight path. I've flown out of Sharm el Sheikh at night time and in the same type of aircraft. And in no way should the pilot allow the airspeed to drop by as much as 30 knots, or the bank angle to change 
beyond five degrees without clearly stating the reasons for the change in the flight path. Investigators are stumped. The Egyptian team suspects the aircraft failed somehow. But there's nothing in the flight data that proves a mechanical failure was capable of bringing the plane down. American investigators want to explore the possibility that the highly regarded pilots may have been at fault. In Egypt, pilots are very respected. And in particular, Air Force pilots are very highly regarded. In an environment like this, the pilot is somewhat immune to suspicion. When something goes wrong, the natural tendency is to blame the equipment. Nevertheless, some investigators begin to consider a provocative theory that might explain the flight's erratic behavior. Turning right, sir. What? Aircraft is turning right. Perhaps Captain Kader had lost his bearings. The plane's flight path into a dark, moonless night is ideal for creating a sense of vertigo. Vertigo is a physiological condition that would exist with any person, not just pilots. And it's based on the inner ear. Over a dark ocean, without a defined visual horizon, no ground lights, the pilot may not be able to perceive visually whether he was flying up, down, left, or right. That may cause the pilot to believe the airplane is flying straight and level when it's actually turning. Soon after takeoff, Captain Kader was flying manually and starts turning left as planned. Heading out over dark water with no visible horizon, it would be very difficult using just his senses for the pilot to know exactly where he was. Left turn. Roger, when ready, inshallah. Left turn to establish 306, Sharm VOR. Investigators need to know how could a veteran combat pilot become so mixed up that he crashes his jet into the ocean. Investigators pour through the cockpit voice recordings and flight data of Flash Airways Flight 604. They're searching for an explanation as to how Captain Kader may have become oblivious to his plane's sudden bank to the right. When you study the movement of the aircraft control surfaces, it appears that something was guiding Captain Cutter to the right. Now, that could have been a false horizon or something he's seen outside of his window. See what the aircraft just did? He thinks he's gained his flight path again. And all of a sudden, at this moment, he receives contradictory information. Turning right, sir. What? In this particular instance, not only are you trying to fly the airplane and understand situationally what's happening, but you're going through the mental gymnastics because your expectations are one way. Meanwhile, you have the first officer who's telling him something that's totally different. But investigators know that with proper training, pilots should trust the help of a co-pilot when disorientation sets in. Investigators are curious. Not yet. Why didn't the co-pilot take control of the plane? The team turns to the Flash Airlines pilot training. They make a disturbing find. Flight crews had not been provided with CRM, or crew resource management training, despite it being a requirement of the company. Had the pilots of Flash Air 604 received a formal CRM training program, the outcome of this flight may have been substantially different. Investigators now believe this explains why the first officer made no attempt to take control of the plane. Formal CRM training would have empowered the first officer who had the best situational awareness and the most information about the position of the airplane to take command of the airplane when he saw that the captain wasn't taking the appropriate corrective action. The final report recognizes that the pitch black night may have fooled the captain's brain into thinking he was flying straight when he wasn't. But Egyptian investigators do not entirely rule out a possible mechanical issue. Aircraft is turning right. Turning right? How turning right? It also suggests that with more of an emphasis on CRM training, the co-pilot may have been able to recover the plane and pull back from the brink of disaster. The pilots are responding based on skills, abilities, knowledge, and what they got out of training. If the training was deficient, that's a company responsibility. 
Proper training can be the difference between life and death. Where there are very few outside visual cues, it can be very easy to get in a position where you're disoriented. And when you're disoriented, you might make decisions as a pilot that'll put that aircraft in danger. And without the use of navigation instruments, a pilot can be flying totally blind. Surabaya, Indonesia. Captain Refri Widodo is in command of Adam Air Flight 574. He's been flying with Adam Air for six months. His first officer, Yoga Susanto, has been with the airline for almost a year and a half. There are 96 passengers and six crew members on today's flight. Eighty knots. Check. You one. Rotate. It's a routine two-hour hop from Surabaya on the island of Java to Manado on the island of Sulawesi, almost 1,700 kilometers northeast. Minutes after takeoff, the crew turns on the autopilot. The flight computer will fly the plane and navigate it along a pre-planned route to Manado. Now passing flight level 220, climbing to flight level 330. Roger, Adam 574, track direct to Diola. Confirmed. Tracking direct to Diola, Adam 574. 22,000 feet below, air traffic controllers track the flight's progress. But they're mystified by what they see. Where's Adam direct to? My God, he's flying north. Less than 30 minutes after takeoff, Flight 574 has flown off course, directly towards a violent storm. I heard your attention. This is your captain speaking. We are about to experience some turbulence. Air traffic controllers work with the flight crew. Yes. To try and understand how far they have drifted off course. The pilots realize the coordinates in the flight navigation system aren't matching their current position. The IRS. 28 is the difference. The weather is making it hard to see. And without a navigation system they can trust, they risk veering even more wildly off course. Getting lost over the ocean is everyone's worry because when you lose trust of your navigation instruments, what do you do? It's starting to fly like a bamboo ship. The pilots of Adam Air Flight 574 are way off course, headed into a bad thunderstorm. Confirm our position. Adam 574, confirm our position, please. Roger, Adam 574, position is 125 miles. Mike, Kilo Sierra, crossing radial 307. Mike, Kilo Sierra. The storm is growing worse. This is crazy. We're going to get lost if it stays like this. Captain Widodo wants to take over navigation of the plane from the flight computer. OK, put the IRS in attitude. Suddenly, a warning. The autopilot has disengaged completely. Then, many of Susanto's computerized instruments go blank. To make matters worse, Flight 574 is now banking right on a dangerous angle. OK, enter this. Captain Widodo wants to re-engage the autopilot. Bank angle. Bank angle. OK, put it back on the Put it on nav again! An alarm tells the pilots they are entering a steep descent. Don't turn it! This is a headache! Whoa. Whoa. Ah. Whoa. Ah. Flight 574 vanishes from radar. Adam 574, you jump control. Adam 574, you jump control.
news of the disappearance spreads quickly. Search and rescue teams are mobilized. Indonesia's National Transportation Safety Committee, or NTSC, is notified. Franz Wienus is the investigator of Adam Air 574. The first steps that we take when there was an accident, we will find all the resources that we have and get the team together before we dispatch to the area. To have any hope of conducting a successful investigation, he needs to locate the wreckage and the black boxes as soon as he can. When the plane was last detected by radar, it was crossing the Makassar Strait. The search area is the size of Ireland. Pinpointing the wreckage is nearly impossible. When the aircraft went missing, it was a bit of a shock for everybody because in this day and age, nobody expects an aircraft to go missing. Within a few weeks of the crash, investigators pinpoint the wreckage some 6,500 feet below the surface. But the airline and Indonesian government can't agree on who should pay for the salvage. After a grueling seven-month-long battle, the salvage operation finally begins. Pull up quadrant three. Because the plane is American-made, Clint Cruikshanks from the National Transportation Safety Board joins the investigation. It was quite deep water, deeper than, uh, than we're normally used to recovering airplanes from. The only items they can recover. That's it. That's it. That's it. Are the aircraft's black boxes. The black boxes is the only source for the evidence that we have, because we don't have uh, the wreckage, we don't have the uh, witnesses. The discovery is a massive breakthrough. The boxes will provide investigators with the first solid clues about why Flight 574 fell from the sky. Roger, Adam 574, track direct to Diola. Confirmed. Tracking direct to Diola, Adam 574. The conversation on the cockpit voice recorder tells investigators that the crew discovered that the plane's navigation system was sending them off course. The IRS. 28 is the difference. They're drifting. They seem preoccupied with fixing the problem. This is messed up. Investigators need to understand why the plane flew so far off the flight path set by the jet's navigation system. To maintain the plane's flight path, the flight computer always has to know the plane's exact location. That information comes from a component called the IRS, or Inertial Reference System. It tracks every adjustment to the plane's course to calculate its exact position. It then feeds that information to the autopilot. The autopilot needs to know where the aircraft is uh, and where it needs to go. Now, the autopilot takes those data from the IRS in terms of height, heading, and speed. Investigators need to know if the IRS was faulty and leading the plane in the wrong direction. They check the IRS information from the flight data recorder. The numbers are fine when they're on the ground. Yes. The data confirms the IRS was properly calibrated before Adam Air Flight 574 took off. This is where it begins. That's right. But for some reason, the IRS began to send the plane off course almost as soon as the flight got into the air. Pull up! Pull up! Investigators now face a disturbing new question. Did a faulty IRS contribute to the jet's catastrophic nosedive into the sea? That just, just gets worse and worse. Indonesian and American investigators dig through Flight 574's maintenance history to better understand why it got lost in space. I have something else I'd like to show you. They discover that the IRS unit that led the plane off course was plagued with problems. As you can tell, there's more than 100 write-ups here. Look at this. 
Same unit. The same problem. That's right. Over the past three months, numerous complaints had been written up. Again and again. The case of the IRS of this aircraft, you know, that unit should have been taken out and sent to maintenance for calibration or repairs. It's a big break in the investigation. But the failing IRS only explains why the plane steered off course. Investigators still don't know what caused the plane to actually crash. To paint a vivid picture of the moments leading up to the mysterious accident, the team creates a computer simulation of the flight by combining the flight data and cockpit voice recorder. Investigators can now see that once Captain Wododo realizes the flight computer is sending the plane off course. Okay, put the IRS in attitude. Co-pilot Susanto overrides the flight computer by switching the navigation system to a mode that would keep the plane flying straight and level. Captain Wododo could now change his course. This is where they switch from nav to attitude. But when the navigation mode is switched, it forces some computerized navigation controls, including the attitude indicator, to go blank for about 30 seconds while they reset. ADI goes off and stays off. During this time, the autopilot systems are totally disengaged, and the pilots need to fly the plane straight and level using visual flight rules. Maintain straight and level constant airspeed flight until attitude displays recover. Approximately 30 seconds. It's in the manual. But with no natural horizon and no navigation control panels, the captain has absolutely no way of knowing if the plane is flying straight. That's where the plane starts its right roll. The pilots are in the perfect conditions necessary to become totally disoriented. The autopilot disengaged when they consciously selected from the nav mode to the attitude mode, and then the aircraft commenced an uh, almost imperceptible roll to the right of around about one degree per second. The crew has no idea that their plane is dipping one degree per second. It's a very common way for pilots to become disoriented. Your body will start to fool you. Your senses will start sending you false information. You might think that you are actually going straight and level while you're actually rolling slowly to the right or to the left. Completely disoriented, Widodo tries to straighten the plane by pulling back on his control column before his wings are level, forcing the plane into a tight spiral dive. It just kept rolling until it almost went inverted and, and just fell, it kind of fell out of the sky once it, it, it got to a point where it wasn't flying like a normal airplane should. Investigators conclude that equipment designed to prevent pilots from getting lost in space tragically failed the crew of Adam Air Flight 574. And when the flight crew got confused and lost their bearings, they couldn't save the plane. Time and again, it's a human factor that can never be completely eliminated as a flight risk. But a pilot can learn how to fight the effect of deceptive illusions with good training. In all of these cases, we see pilots that are disoriented as to which way is right side up. It means that you have to revert back to your primary uh, instrument training of trust the instruments. That's one of the lessons that we learned and it continues to evolve today. Do you read, over? All radio contact is lost with a plane carrying 115 passengers. Everybody's mind was going to a hijack or terrorist. High above the Taiwan Strait, a 747 jumbo jet goes mysteriously silent. Dynasty 611 Taipei. So the first thing you think about is a bomb. And when controllers lose contact with a private jet, fighter pilots scramble to intercept. Everybody knew that there was a major problem. 
Three perplexing cases of radio silence send investigators hunting for answers. Do you read? Over. Radio silence can mean a long and dark mystery unfolding as the world watches, or it can mean that your plane has just devastatingly been blown from the sky. It's early morning on the island of Cyprus, as the crew of Helios Airways Flight 522 prepare for today's flight. Sure is a beautiful day. Maybe I shouldn't have come in. Andreas Prodromu wasn't scheduled for the flight, but he's offered to work to spend some time with his girlfriend, another flight attendant. Temperature's still up. In the cockpit, the flight crew is occupied with the daily routine of preparing their jet for takeoff. Right today. Captain Hans Merton is a contract pilot hired by Helios for the busy holiday season. Are you almost through? Nearly. First officer Pambu Haralambus has been flying with Helios for five years. Sorry, could you start trains? We your seat back in front of it. The Boeing 737 is carrying a total of 115 passengers and six crew members. Flight attendants, please take your seats. Prepare to take off. Just after nine in the morning, Helios Airways Flight 522 lifts off. This is Helios 522. Request cruising at 340. Helios 522, you are cleared to climb to 340. Have a good day. Set 340. 340. Flight 522 is an hour and a half flight from Larnaca, Cyprus to Athens, Greece. The plane is still climbing towards its cruising altitude, when suddenly... What is it? Takeoff config warning? The takeoff configuration alarm warns pilots that their jet isn't ready for takeoff. But why is it sounding now during flight? The captain radios the Helios operations center back in Cyprus. Operations, this is flight 522, over. Flight 522, what can I do for you? We have a takeoff config warning on. Then the situation becomes even more confusing. We now have a master caution. I'll get you an engineer. 522, just a minute. In the cabin, the passengers are hardly aware there's a problem until... Everyone, stay calm, and please remain seated. Everyone, please put the oxygen masks on completely over your mouth and nose. In the cockpit, the pilots still don't know why both alarms are sounding. Can you confirm that the pressurization panel is set to auto? Where are my equipment cooling circuit breakers? Behind the captain's seat. Can you see them? As the plane continues to climb, passengers and crew are growing concerned. Helios 522, can you see the circuit breakers? But the Helios crew doesn't respond. Helios 522, can you hear me? Athens air traffic controllers can see the plane is still on course, high over the Mediterranean Sea. Ilios 522. Do you read? Over. But all they're getting is radio silence. 
We heard that uh, there was an airplane which was flying into the Creek territory and uh, had no communication. Everybody's mind was going to a hijack or to terrorists. The passenger jet has been in the air for over two hours. They were scheduled to land 30 minutes ago. The plane is now circling in a holding pattern over Athens, a city of over three million people. The Greek Air Force scrambles two fighter jets to investigate. Helios 522, do you read? Over. Helios 522, do you read? Over. One of the jets flies closer. Someone is in the first officer's seat, slumped over the controls. But there's no sign of the captain at all. Athena ACC. Athena ACC. Checking the camera. He can see passengers in their seats, but none of them react to the presence of the jet. Then the pilot sees someone moving into the cockpit. Athena Control, there is one person moving in the cockpit of Helios 522. Repeat, there is one person inside the cockpit. Helios 522, do you read? Over. Flight HCY 522, this is Athena Radar Control. Suddenly, the 737 turns left and begins to quickly descend. Athena, ACC, Helios 522, turning sharply, following down. The aircraft is dropping from more than 32,000 feet. ACY 522, this is Athena, radar control. Just after 12 o'clock. Flight 522 slams into the ground just north of Athens. Helios 522 is down on Gramatico Hill. Over. It's an eerie disaster. For over an hour, air traffic controllers watched the passenger jet fly in radio silence closer and closer to Athens, with no idea what was happening inside the jet. Investigators and first responders rushed to the burning crash site. There we were, facing the situation which was beyond any description. It was black, burning, people spread, pieces of, of, uh, of the airplane. There are no survivors. It's the worst air crash in Greek history. In the Helios event, there was really nothing they could do from the ground to help the aircraft. There wasn't any warning, there wasn't any idea from air traffic control that there was sort of any issue until there was no contact. Chief Investigator Tsolakis and his team get to work immediately, combing through what remains of the passenger jet. Recovered bodies start to arrive at the morgue in Athens. It is a truly nightmarish sight. I hope that I never experience it again. It was terrible, just terrible. When investigators find tissue samples in the remains of the cockpit, they make a stunning discovery. The person at the controls of the plane when it crashed was flight attendant Andreas Prodromu. But why was he in the cockpit? Was he trying to save the plane? Or did he deliberately fly it into the ground? Investigators have recovered the cockpit voice recorder from Helios Flight 522. When Chief Investigator Tsolakis listens to the final moments of the flight, it answers a vital question. This was no terrorist act. Helios Airways, flight five, two, two. Flight attendant Prodromu was calling for help. Tsolakis hears five separate maydays on the tape, but they were never heard by air traffic controllers. Investigators suspect the radio was still tuned to Cyprus, their departure point. He wasn't a coward. He knew something about planes, and he had the capacity to do something. 
για να μπορέσουν να σωθούν τα άνθρωποι μέσα στο αεροπλάνο. Sure is a beautiful day. In fact, Prodromu had his commercial pilot's license, but all of his training wouldn't have saved the jet. When the team reviews the flight data recorder, they discover that the Helios plane sharply descended because it was out of fuel. DFDR and uh, CVR gave us absolute proof that the plane ran out of fuel, and this was the cause of the crash. But one mystery still remains. Why was Prodromu flying the aircraft? What happened to the flight crew? Back at the crash site, investigators catch a break when a key control panel is recovered. The panel, which is responsible for pressurization, is set in an unusual position. Are you sure this is the way it was found? It hasn't been moved at all. We were lucky finding this panel, which had the switch on the manual position, was a major one. Normally, pressurization happens automatically. But when the switch is set to manual, the flight crew are responsible for controlling the cabin pressure. But why would the crew set the system to manual? When Solakis interviews the Helios engineer, he learns the accident aircraft had a history of pressurization problems. Coincidentally, on the day of the fatal flight, engineers inspected the aircraft for air leaks that could cause depressurization. Switching digital pressure control unit from auto to manual. Using the aircraft's power systems, the engineer pressurized the cabin for several minutes while another engineer checked for leaks. But there was no sign of any air escaping. They were supposed to return uh, the uh, selector to the auto position. But at the end of the test, the engineer left the switch in the manual position. Switch is bright today. Are you almost through? Nearly. Investigators theorize that neither the pilot nor first officer noticed the manual setting during pre-flight preparations. As a result, the cabin would not have pressurized properly, causing the incapacitation of everyone on board. <laughs> to prove their theory, they perform a test flight using the same conditions as the Helios flight. Make sure the P-5 is set to manual. Solakis has the crew turn the pressurization switch to manual. Uh, it's hard to see. As the test flight climbs, oxygen thins quickly in the aircraft. The same thing happened on the Helios flight, triggering an alarm. What is it? The takeoff config warning? But when the alarm goes off on the test flight, Solakis makes a shocking discovery. It's not the takeoff config alarm that sounds, but rather the depressurization alarm. The two alarms sound virtually identical. Okay, take it down. The alarm sounded, and that alarm was misinterpreted. Most of flight crew, they will never face uh, an alarm with no pressurization because it's a rare event. Even if the flight crew did misinterpret the first alarm, Solakis learns they had another chance to determine what the problem was. When he revisits the cockpit recording, Solakis hears the plane's master caution alarm sounding for almost a minute. We now have a master caution. The master caution alarm can indicate that the plane's systems are overheating but it can also tell pilots the oxygen masks are down. The lack of oxygen probably caused the pilots to confuse the alarms. Instead of pressurization, they thought the plane was overheating and needed to be cooled. Where are my equipment cooling circuit breakers? Behind the captain's seat. They began to lose the ability to think coherently. Investigators believe the captain may have been checking on the circuit breakers behind his seat when he and the first officer ran out of air. The autopilot system maintained the flight path to Athens and then put the plane in a holding pattern as it flew over the airport. 
in the cabin as the emergency oxygen supply runs out. Everyone takes their last breaths. Well, the problem with the passenger masks is they're designed to give you enough oxygen so that you can survive until you can, the pilots get the airplane down to a low altitude. Passenger masks are supplied by a chemical generator above their seats. But the generators only produce enough oxygen to last about 12 minutes. Most of the people, once the hypoxia begins to cause them to lose consciousness, they're just going to go to sleep. So how did Andreas Prodromu remain conscious? When investigators interview Helios instructors and crew, they begin to understand what may have happened. After the passenger oxygen system stopped working, Prodromu most likely used some of the 737's portable oxygen to survive. Probably was a little bit disoriented. He's reacting a lot slower than he normally would. The young flight attendant calls for help, but no one could hear him, and there was nothing he could have done. The official report shows that a fatal combination of small mechanical problems and human error led to the worst air disaster in Greek history. It was the flipping of one switch. That was the difference between life and death. And what came out of this investigation was a, um, basically a re-emphasis to flight crews. You have to do checklists. You have to have that checklist discipline. But not all cases of radio silence unfold over many hours. Sometimes they happen in the blink of an eye. Dynasty 611, Taipei. Dynasty 611, Taipei. China Airlines Flight 611 lifts off from Taiwan's capital, Taipei. Gear up. Dynasty 611, airborne passing 1,600. Dynasty 611, Taipei approach radar, contact climb and maintain flight level 260. 260, Dynasty 611. Autopilot B, engage. There are 225 people on board the Boeing 747. Ladies and gentlemen, the fastened seatbelt sign has been turned off. For your safety, we do recommend that you keep your seatbelt fastened at all times while seated. Flight 611 is an hour and 40 minute trip across the Taiwan Strait to Hong Kong. The aircraft continues to climb steadily to its cruising altitude. But then, 20 minutes after taking off, at an altitude of almost 35,000 feet, the flight vanishes from radar. Dynasty 611, Taipei. Air traffic control gets no response. I've got a plane off radar, China Airlines 611. Its last known return was east 119.67, north 23.98. 本时段背勤同仁, Taiwanese authorities quickly launch one of the largest rescue missions in the country's aviation history. Flight 611 was 34 miles from the Taiwanese shore, just north of the Penghu Islands when it disappeared. Within hours, rescuers find debris floating in the Taiwan Strait. There are no survivors. Airplanes don't fall out of the sky. We have had so many uh, aircraft accidents over the past 50 years that have ended up in water. It's always a challenge because the first thing is to find the wreckage. The second thing is to pull enough of it up to be useful to the accident investigation. Taiwan's Aviation Safety Council, or ASC, begins its investigation into the mysterious crash of the 747. Delivered August 2nd, 1979. Kay Young is the managing director of the ASC. He'll be leading the investigation. We're setting up a command post in Penghu Island. This particular uh, investigation was by far the most difficult one. And uh, one of the reasons why was it's, it's an ocean floor. 
while recovery teams gather the floating wreckage. Good morning. I'm anxious to see what you have. Kay Young reviews the radar recording of the doomed flight. Minutes into the recording, he makes a critical discovery. Shortly after reaching 35,000 feet, flight 611's signal suddenly splits apart. The breakup is quite graphic. There were four sizable pieces of wreckage that were getting radar returns that then began to drift and scatter as they fell to the Earth. So that told us that the airplane broke up in flight. But why would one of the world's most dependable passenger jets come apart in midair? Since the accident involved an American-made plane, a team from the National Transportation Safety Board is dispatched to Taiwan. Good morning, I'm Clay Crookshanks from the NTSB, hello. Three weeks after the crash, the Yan Steen, a sophisticated salvage vessel, arrives in the Taiwan Strait. Using the vessel's sonar technology, investigators locate the remaining wreckage of Flight 611 deep underwater. It was really quite a shock when I first saw pieces on the, on the floor of the ocean. Remarkably, 25 days after the crash of Flight 611, the plane's two black boxes are found. Investigators hope the data will help explain why the 747 exploded in midair. They begin with the plane's cockpit voice recorder. Clear for takeoff, Dynasty 611. Takeoff. 80. Check. E1. Rotate. In the moments before the disaster, nothing seems wrong. The captain calls out the distance to their cruising altitude. 2,000. That's followed by the sound of a chime, alerting the crew that they are nearing 35,000 feet. But then, The recording stops. The recorders told us that something happened, but we didn't have the real piece of evidence that told us what initiated the breakup of the 747. The flight recorders are a dead end. The fate of the investigation lies in what can be uncovered in the wreckage of Flight 611. I've been reading about the trajectory analysis. I'd like to try it. Computerized ballistic trajectory analysis is based on a simple fact. The pieces that came off the plane first are the first to hit the water. If investigators can figure out which pieces those were, they'll know where the trouble began. 327. Kay Young selects 18 pieces of wreckage from all over the plane for the computer analysis. 199. Can we see when each one of those items separated from the aircraft? His team uses GPS coordinates of the wreckage, as well as precise details on ocean currents and wind speed, to calculate which pieces were the first to come off the plane. The tail came off first. It's a huge discovery for investigators. Well, that's pretty much indicating that there's something happened in the back of the aircraft. Now the team needs to track down pieces from the tail section but wreckage is still being recovered from the ocean floor. Will they be able to find the source of the breakup that led to the deaths of 225 people? <coughs> While searching through newly recovered wreckage from China Airlines Flight 611, NTSB investigator Frank Zakar spots something unusual. And I walked up to item 640 and noticed that there were some peculiar areas of interest that I wanted to look at a little bit further. Zakhar needs to get a closer look at the mysterious piece. It's from the back of the plane, precisely where the analysis told them the breakup began. Let's get as many pictures as we can, especially the edges there and there. But then the team notices a concerning detail. The wreckage has a metal patch on it 
called a doubler plate. If there were to be a tear or a crack identified, you'd want to repair the fuselage back to its original strength. And one way to do that is to put a doubler plate right over the existing structure. At some point, this section of the 747 had been repaired. Investigators need to know why and how it was done. Let's cut it from here to here and send this piece to Chongshan. A large piece of the wreckage is sent to a military research center for expert analysis. When the repair patch is removed, damage on the aluminum skin underneath intrigues investigators. We noticed that there were some fairly long gouge marks. This is beyond the kind of damage a doubler is meant to patch. That was an aha moment that we, we might have something here. Investigators wonder what caused the gouges on the aircraft's aluminum exterior. When they search the plane's extensive maintenance records, they uncover a very short reference to a mishap 22 years earlier. Speed is low, sir. Watch it. Tail strike, sir. I better log that. The tail section of the 747 scraped the runway on landing. But when investigators search for details on how China Airlines repaired the plane, they make a shocking discovery. The maintenance records indicated that the permanent repair was done in accordance with Boeing recommendations. Evidence that we uncovered indicate that the repair was not done per the Boeing repair manual. According to the manual, the entire damaged area should have been cut out and replaced. But the repair was never done. Workers simply attached a doubler plate over the damaged area. What was so insidious about this improper repair was that the doubler plate hid all of the damage. Workers recorded the repair was completed, making their mistake impossible to detect. So if you weren't there watching them do this repair improperly, you wouldn't know that it was done improperly. Every time the plane took off over the next 22 years, the cracks in the plane's skin grew and spread. It just spread like a spider web. It went in all directions, and it probably looped all the way around the fuselage to the point where the entire aft section of the airplane just broke off from the rest of the structure. Investigators recommend that aviation agencies around the world immediately inspect repairs that were patched using doubler plates. We were requiring operators to take doubler plates off and do a visual inspection of the structure underneath. The NTSB issues its own recommendation that mechanics be warned of hiding damage that could lead to the failure of an airplane. The airline literally had 22 years or so to get this right. So this is a wake-up call. Any airline that has this kind of issue has to be keenly aware that the responsibility never goes away. And when a private jet with a celebrity passenger falls into radio silence over Florida... This is Jacksonville Center. I'm declaring an emergency. Fighter jets scramble to find out why. We don't know where this aircraft is going to go, but it's starting to move. It's 8.30 a.m. at Orlando International Airport. The crew of a private Learjet is preparing for today's flight. Now flight. On. Radio. Are set. morning. American pro golfer Payne Stewart is on his way to Dallas with some close business associates. Known for his flamboyant attire and remarkable swing, Stewart is one of the most popular golfers on tour. He's just won the US Open, his third major championship win. Stewart flies regularly on a Learjet, a luxury aircraft that was originally modeled after an American military plane. 
47 Bravo Alpha, you are cleared for takeoff. You ready? Okay, here we go, and takeoff thrust. Captain Michael Kling is a former Air Force pilot and flight instructor. P1? First Officer Stephanie Belagarig has less than 100 hours in the Lear. She's keen to log more flight time. Rotate. At 9.19 a.m., the Learjet lifts off. Good morning, Jacksonville. This is Learjet 47 Bravo Alpha, climbing to flight level 260. Good morning, 47 Bravo Alpha. Climb and maintain flight level 390. The controller clears the jet to keep climbing up to 39,000 feet. The flight plan calls for the airplane to fly northwest towards Cross City, Florida then turn west and fly direct to Dallas. The Learjet has traveled 80 miles. It's time to pass control of the plane over to a new air traffic controller. 47 Bravo Alpha, contact Jack Center at 135.65. The controller gives the crew the new frequency. Air traffic control is a series of what we call handoffs. And that means that it's time for him to cross to somebody else's sector. 47 Bravo Alpha, please acknowledge. I didn't get her an acknowledgement for that frequency change. So you give her a moment. 47 Bravo Alpha, contact Jack Center on 135.65. There's only radio silence from the Learjet. What's up? It's that Learjet. It's not answering. Maybe he's off frequency. Let's see if it levels off when it's supposed to. But when the aircraft reaches its cruising altitude of 39,000 feet... They're still climbing. Let me see their flight plan. We've got a turn coming across city. Let's hope they make that turn. The tension level was so high, you could hear a pin drop. Damn it. It's not making a course correction. There was something terribly wrong. This is Jacksonville Center. I'm declaring an emergency. Ben's in here. Experts at the National Transportation Safety Board are notified of the escalating emergency. Once the aircraft had gone rogue, so to speak, the next step is to try to figure out why. To track down the wayward Learjet, controllers call in F-16 fighters, including pilot Kent Olson. Is the crew incapacitated? Is there something wrong with the aircraft? There's some reason why that crew is not communicating with air traffic control. So our job is to go up and find out why. Meanwhile, the NTSB recruit Learjet investigator Jim Tidball to the team. Where is it right now? His first task is to determine how far the plane can get with the amount of fuel on board. When the airplane didn't make its turn, it continued on towards Memphis. And after Memphis, it was uh, headed towards St. Louis. If it went down in those areas, there'd be mass casualties. If it doesn't change course soon, the fighter jets may be forced to take drastic measures. ATC kept giving the team real-time data as to where the airplane was, and calculating the fuel burn at those altitudes, we could figure how far it was going to go. My best guess is South Dakota, possibly North Dakota. In the air, the F-16 pilots catch up with the rogue plane. Can he see anything in the cockpit? The windows of the aircraft provide an ominous clue. No movement and the window's covered in frost. If the people are conscious, they'd be trying to scrape away that condensation so they could see. So if you see no attempt to get rid of that condensation, your mind goes, what's the condition of the crew and the passengers that are on board of the aircraft? Defrosted over windscreen and a darkened cockpit and cabin uh, indicated that uh, the crew was probably no longer with us. 
After nearly four hours in the air, the Learjet approaches Aberdeen, South Dakota. According to calculations, the jet is almost out of fuel. They're going down, they're going down. The plane is spiraling towards the ground. Investigators have no idea where it will crash. All they can do is wait. A Learjet carrying pro golfer Payne Stewart and five other people is falling from the sky over South Dakota. Senator, I've got a crash site. The jet has slammed into a hayfield near Aberdeen, South Dakota. There are no survivors. When NTSB investigators arrive at the crash site, they discover the aircraft has completely disintegrated. When you've had a vertical impact at high speed and everything is compressed and in pieces, you gotta dig all that out, you gotta identify what's where, you've got nothing but shards and scraps. Remarkably, the Learjet's only black box, the cockpit voice recorder, is recovered. I only hope we hear something that tells us what went wrong. It was sent back immediately to the NTSB lab, and they did a fantastic job of piecing this thing together and getting data out of the CVR. OK. Let's hear it. As they listen, investigators make a disturbing discovery. It was eerie because the airplane is flying, and there is no voice whatsoever. But one sound provides a vital clue. That's the cabin altitude warning. We are definitely looking at a loss of pressure accident. The cabin altitude alarm sounds when the aircraft's cabin hasn't been properly pressurized, meaning the passengers and crew aren't receiving enough oxygen. The mystery now is why did the Learjet lose vital cabin pressure? Unfortunately, investigators have limited evidence to work with. The disintegrated wreckage is a dead end, and the Learjet is not equipped with a flight data recorder. Because of the chaotic nature of airplane accidents, you don't have a lot of clues sometimes, but that doesn't mean that we, we stop investigating. Set us to climb, please. The team hopes a flight simulation will help determine what happened on board after the cabin lost pressure. There goes the cabin altitude warning. Start the clock. Emergency checklist. Got it. I think all of us sort of had in our heads the checklist will have, once you hear the altitude warning horn, that you're going to put your oxygen mask on as the first and immediate action item. Benzen scans the same emergency checklist that was used by the Learjet pilots. At 10,000 plus or minus 500 feet cabin altitude, control pressure to the outflow valve is trapped. It leads him to an astonishing discovery. We were surprised because it implied pretty strongly that you need to troubleshoot a pressurization problem. First step should have been don oxygen masks. The oxygen mask instruction is much further down the list. You've got maybe four or five seconds worth of actual oxygen in your brain. Um, and then another 12 to 15 seconds in your circulation. Once all that is gone, things are going to go very horribly awry for you very, very quickly. Investigators finally have a theory about what may have happened on board the Learjet. Everything is fine. Then something causes the plane to lose pressure. We've got a cabin altitude warning. Emergency checklist. Uh. They reach for their checklist and start to troubleshoot. What does the checklist say? At 10,000 plus or minus 500 feet, have an altitude control pressure to the outflow valve is trapped. They picked up a checklist, read it, was co were confused by it, and the oxygen masks were sitting there unused. 
After 15 seconds without oxygen, the crew would be confused and disoriented. Uh, read that again. But before they can solve the problem, the crew loses consciousness. The Lear checklist, in a sense, could lead a crew astray. Without those masks on, they wouldn't stand a chance. Investigators are never able to determine conclusively what caused the plane to lose pressure. The decompression could have been caused by a, a leaky seal on a door, a, a small leak about the size of a, uh, a pencil in the side of the aircraft, a malfunction within the system. So we don't know. But whatever the reason, the crew would likely have recovered if they had put their masks on. The NTSB in its report ultimately concluded that had they received oxygen in a timely manner, it's likely that we would not be talking about this particular accident today. We've got a cabin altitude warning. Emergency checklist. Following the investigation, the NTSB recommends important changes to aviation checklists. We asked very strongly that uh, that checklist that we suspected got the crew in trouble be changed to make it clearer and, and more useful in an emergency. The FAA is quick to respond. Don oxygen masks is now the first item on the checklist, not just for Learjets, but for every similar plane in the sky. When we look at the accidents involving no radio communication, there's a lot of questions to be asked. Radio silence between pilots and air traffic controllers can mean many different things, but only the physical evidence can tell the real story. When a passenger jet owned by Formula One superstar Nicky Lauda plummets to Earth, he's driven to find out why. Where was the tail found? I was upset that the airplane did something where a human being couldn't react anymore. When two DC-10s are brought down within two years... What happened? The cabin blew out! Investigators unlock shocking discoveries. Design flaw issues can typically affect the entire fleet. Are there other ones that are about to happen? Get out of it, Chip! Come on! And a doomed commuter flight in Georgia comes down to a faulty design. My God. Are three horrific accidents, all because of deadly defects. By design flaw that leads to a loss of an aircraft, it draws the attention of the entire world. trim to the left, huh? What's that? You need a little bit of auto trim to the left. Ascending to cruising altitude, okay. Captain Thomas Welch and First Officer Josef Thurner are flying a Boeing 767 from Bangkok, Thailand to Vienna, Austria. The flight is operated by Lauda Air. The brainchild of famed Austrian Formula One driver, Niki Lauda. For me, it was a logical step after retiring from racing uh, to start in this kind of business. And that's what I did with Lauda Air. His new airline is a small fleet of just four planes. One of the main reasons was to give the passengers a different way of flying, better service, better food. The airplane had to look in a, in a certain way. Lauda Air Flight 4 is less than 15 minutes into its 11-hour flight to Vienna. Capture 13, Fuge plus 13, reserve is 20. In the cockpit, Captain Welch and First Officer Thurner monitor their instruments, while the autopilot controls the climb. Suddenly, the plane begins dropping from the sky. Wait a minute. In an instant, the pilots lose all control. Oh, and 
and their jet plunges towards the ground. In a matter of seconds, the jet falls more than 20,000 feet. The plane slams into a remote jungle, 110 miles northwest of Bangkok. I was at home and I had a phone call from the news. Uh, they said one of the airplanes crashed. When rescuers arrive, it's immediately obvious that there's no one to be rescued. All 213 passengers and 10 crew members are dead. It's the first time a Boeing 767 has ever crashed. The loss of a US-made aircraft prompts quick action from the National Transportation Safety Board, or NTSB. Bob McIntosh is assigned to the investigation. The uh, first crash of an aircraft that was in service intercontinentally uh, for almost a decade with a perfect service record. It was extremely important for us to learn what had happened. He finds the badly burned wreckage strewn over a square mile of rough terrain. The major components, the cockpit, uh, the tail, the main body, they were scattered far enough apart that certainly they had not come down together. McIntosh immediately knows the plane broke up during the flight. What he needs to uncover is why. Where was the tail found? Airline owner Nikki Lauda arrives in Thailand to help find the answer. The scene for me, this was the most uh, horrific pictures I've ever seen. Surrounded by the scattered remains of an airliner that carries his name, Lauda is overwhelmed by the magnitude of the disaster. When you have 223 people killed, the families all want to know why. And I think this is the worst for people if they do not know why they lost their husband, children, or whatsoever. The black boxes may have captured important clues about the cause of the in-flight breakup, but they're badly burned. They're sent to NTSB technicians in Washington. Then, days after the crash, well, would you look at that? More pieces of the plane are found, including one of the engines. And investigators are amazed by what they see. The thrust reverser on Flight 4's left engine is fully deployed. Once we actually saw that the thrust reverser had deployed, for me, it was, it was shocking. Thrust reversers are only used on landing. Once activated, they direct airflow forward, helping the 767 come to a stop. They should never be deployed in the air. And even if it does happen, a deployed reverser shouldn't cause a crash. This discovery is the biggest break so far, and investigators need to know was a deployed thrust reverser responsible for the crash? But the team will have to solve the mystery without their most valuable tool. The flight data recorder is so badly burned, the technicians at the NTSB can't recover any data. Thankfully, the cockpit voice recorder has survived. Ready to go. Investigators and Nikki Lauda listen to the last moments of Lauda Air Flight 4. 80 knots. Check. Five and a half minutes into the 15 minute long flight, everything is normal. Then, the first sign of trouble. Chaser? Yeah, that keeps, uh. It's come on. What's come on? Some kind of warning they discover louder pilots discuss a mysterious cockpit warning moments before the crash. 
It's a warning that relates to a hydraulic valve in the left engine's thrust reverser. The hydraulic isolation valve controls the flow of hydraulic fluid to the reversers. Opening the valve allows the reverser to be stowed or deployed. When it's closed, the reversers won't budge. OK. Yeah. The crew doesn't sound worried about the warning. No, it's probably moisture or something. For five minutes, nothing happens. Then... Oh, reversers deployed! Just 22 seconds later, there's the sound of the plane ripping to pieces. The whole thing was so difficult. You, you never forget. More motivated than ever, Lauda sets out to prove a controversial theory explaining why his plane went down. I was after Boeing day and night so that the people understand that we're working on it, that we hopefully find the cause and make sure it will never ever happen again because this is the answers these families needed. Nikki Lauda travels to Boeing headquarters in Seattle to investigate the 767's thrust reverses. It's my name, my airplane, my crash, and Boeing understood my problem or their problem, and we kept on working together. Before the 767 first went into service, Boeing ran certification tests to prove that pilots could keep flying safely in the event of a mid-air reverser deployment. The tests proved that the 767 was capable of continued safe flight and landing, regardless of the position of the thrust reverser. The widespread feeling of what uh, would happen if a reverser deployed in flight was that the airplane would be controllable. But despite Boeing's certification tests, Lauda believes the reverser is to blame. I know what it says, but that's not what happened in Thailand. And he's determined to figure out why a failure that's not supposed to be dangerous killed 223 people flying on his airline. OK, let's try it in a simulator. Nikki Lauda works with Boeing investigators to recreate the flight. OK, let's begin. He sets the flight's altitude to 24,000 feet more than double the 10,000 feet that Boeing used for their thrust reverser certification. Could the altitude difference explain what happened? It was incredible, because the airplane just turned around and you couldn't do anything. Lauda now knows definitively why his plane dropped so unexpectedly. When the thrust reverser deployed, the smooth flow of air over the wing was disrupted, dramatically decreasing lift. Reverse deployed! This forced the jet into a sudden, terrifying nosedive. It was just too late. The aircraft was going to assume a very nose-low, high-speed uh, attitude. Incredibly, Nikki Lauda has proven Boeing's certification test was lacking. He's shown that above 20,000 feet, where planes fly faster, the accidental deployment of a thrust reverser can be fatal. It was evident to the Boeing company and to the uh, FAA certification authorities and to the operators of Boeing 767s around the world that this was going to be a major, major issue. The reverser deployed, and those guys couldn't recover. Let's figure out why that happened. Now, the 767's thrust reversers undergo intensive study at Boeing. Engineers can imagine only one scenario that might make a reverser deploy unexpectedly in midair. The theory calls for the activation of the two valves in the reverser's failsafe system at the same time. The first valve is the isolation valve that controls the flow of hydraulic fluid. When the second valve, called the directional control valve, is activated, 
fluid freely moves the reverser from stowed to deployed. You have to have both the isolation valve open and the directional control valve at the engine open to the deployed position. After extensive testing, engineers finally make a major breakthrough. They're able to trigger the double failure needed to accidentally deploy a reverser. We could get that system to activate by introducing a, a short, in a, a direct short in a system. Investigators consult with Boeing engineers on the 767's infrastructure. They discover that the wires for both valves were bundled in the same harness. A fault across several wires in the same harness could have triggered simultaneous short circuits. Two shorts in two valves at exactly the same time? What are the odds? I was upset that, that the airplane did something where a human being couldn't react anymore. Investigators have revealed a serious design flaw that allows thrust reversers to deploy accidentally. Pressure builds for a full review of the thrust reverser system on all 767s. There were other airlines that uh, joined in the questioning of uh, how could this possibly uh, affect the flight path to the point where you lose control. As a result of the louder investigation, a series of mechanical locks now ensure that even if both valves get energized in flight, the reversers can't deploy. For Nicky Lauder, the outcome of this investigation is total vindication. For me, the worst thing in life is gray areas. I hate gray areas, and there are a lot of airplane crashes been in the past where you really do not know exactly what happened. And in this crash here, thank God, it was clear what was the cause, and it was fixed for all airplanes worldwide. Even when new airliners go through exhaustive testing before they're put in service, a design flaw can occasionally slip through the cracks. I think due to the complexity of these aircraft, uh, there, there are any number of things can go wrong, even under the best set of circumstances. 17 years earlier, is a deadly design flaw. The cabin flew out! Responsible for the worst air crash to date. Turkish Airlines Flight 981 is boarding at Orly Airport in Paris. Normally, the last leg of this trip from Turkey to England isn't very crowded. But today, the DC-10 is filling up fast. With all the new passengers boarding, Captain Nejat Burkos and co-pilot Oral Uluzman are running a little behind schedule. So is baggage handler Mohammed Mahmoudi, who's loading the luggage of all 335 passengers. Yeah, je la fais. Not expecting any more bags, Mahmoudi locks the rear cargo door. The DC-10 is set to go. Just after 12.30 in the afternoon, Flight 981 lifts off into the skies above Paris. Tango Hotel Yankee, 981, you are cleared to flight level 230. 981, roger. As it flies away from the airport, the DC-10 continues to gain altitude. They're still climbing at 10,000 feet when disaster strikes.
the huge jet shudders and begins to drop. What happened? The cabin blew out! As the nose pitches down, the plane picks up speed and the crew struggles to save their plummeting jet. Bring it up! I can't bring it up! She doesn't respond! In the cabin, two rows of seats have simply disappeared. Anything not bolted down flies out of the plane through a gaping hole in the cabin floor. It looks like we're going to hit the ground! Me! Turkish Airways Flight 981 disintegrates at impact. None of the 346 people on board survive. It becomes the worst plane crash to date. Paul Eddy is a journalist who covered the story as it unfolded. It was just a scene of absolute, utter devastation. I still have nightmares about this. Investigators for the French Accident Investigation Bureau are on the scene. My first job was to um, evaluate the scope of the wreckage and begin the first investigation on the spot. Despite the enormous force of the crash, the black boxes survive. Their contents could provide valuable clues. The inquiry takes a bizarre turn when investigators are called to a field nine miles from the main crash site. They find the rear cargo door and two rows of seats that somehow fell from the DC-10. Since the accident involves an American plane, Chuck Miller from the National Transportation Safety Board joins the investigation. He was a very, very professional man. Chuck didn't sit back at, in the office. Chuck was always on the scene. For him, the scene is eerily familiar. For the second time in two years, he's dealing with a DC-10. In June 1972, a plane's cargo door and some cargo were found in a field 18 miles from Windsor, Ontario, Canada. They had been ripped from a brand new DC-10 as it flew to Buffalo. But the Windsor incident ended differently as the pilots of American Airlines Flight 96 were able to land the plane safely. When the flight crew finally saw the damage, they were stunned by a hole where the cargo door would normally be. The captain and I walked back to the um, back, and we just looked up and saw this hole. And it was just so weird. It didn't take investigators long to realize the very design of the cargo door carried a latent, fatal flaw. When it closes, hooks on the DC-10's cargo door grab hold of a bar on the plane's door frame. To make sure it's locked, baggage handlers push down on the lever, which drives locking pins through the hooks that hold them in place. Without this heavy-duty mechanism, the extreme air pressure, thousands of feet in the air, would rip the door right off the plane. The 1972 discovery was terrifying. The NTSB realized it was possible to close the lever on the outside of the door, even if the hooks and locking pins were not in the closed position. Engage the lever. That meant baggage handlers could believe the door was locked when it wasn't. In the Windsor incident, there was an obvious flaw. And that's where the NTSB said, let's make sure we change this system right now. Every DC-10 operator needs to know this. 
In 1972, Chuck Miller's report strongly recommended changes to the DC-10's cargo door locking mechanism be made as soon as possible. Two years later, as Miller inspects the Turkish Airlines crash site, he's immediately troubled. If Miller's recommendations were implemented after the Windsor incident, why has another DC-10 cargo door been ripped from its plane? When he saw the door, saw that the fix hadn't been made, and that's when uh, I think his anger uh, became very, very strong indeed. Miller takes an unusual step. Although the official investigation is just beginning, he gives journalist Paul Eddy an important tip. Now, I said, have you got any ideas what made the door come off? And he said, yeah. If I were you, I'd go and look at a place called Windsor, Ontario. Suspecting that two similar incidents within two years with the DC-10 are connected... I'm Chuck Miller. NTSB investigator Chuck Miller shares his theory with French investigators. These were taken on June 12th, 1972, right after the incident. We asked for the report on the Windsor accident, and uh, our uh, American colleagues were also uh, volunteers to give us a lot of details. The French team are astonished by what Miller shows them. Now, we had an American Airlines flight from Detroit to Buffalo have its cargo door blow off. And he has been very frank and had explained what he was thinking of the Windsor accident. With the information from Chuck Miller, French investigators take a closer look at the plane's cargo door. There is no new problem. It's just like the 1972 American Airlines case all over again. The latches that are supposed to hold the cargo door closed aren't locked. What you've got to now discover is why wasn't that door fixed? So, I don't think it's... In the wake of the 1972 Windsor incident, the NTSB had made very specific recommendations to the Federal Aviation Administration. Engage the lever. Most importantly, they suggested that a change be made to the locking mechanism. But in the two years since that accident, none of those recommendations had been implemented by McDonnell Douglas, the company who manufactures the DC-10. In fact, the FAA never issued an airworthiness directive, a legal requirement that would ensure fixes were made. It's the job of the NTSB to discover what's happened, uh, and to, to come up with recommendations as to how to prevent it happening again, but it has absolutely no authority to implement them. Investigators learned that McDonnell Douglas had made some minor changes to the cargo doors. A peephole was cut in the bottom of the door so baggage handlers could see if the locking pins had engaged. Several warning signs were also attached to the plane's door. But sadly, those fixes just created their own problems. Many baggage handlers didn't know what the small hole in the door was for. The baggage handler in Paris read and spoke three languages, but not English, the only language in which the warning signs were written. But in the eyes of Chuck Miller, these were Band-Aid solutions. The fundamental flawed design with the locks remained the same, allowing history to repeat itself just two years later. There is no question that if an airworthiness directive had been issued, as it should have been after Windsor, Paris would not have happened. It was an entirely avoidable accident. After the Paris crash, foolproof changes were finally made to the DC-10's cargo door. Well, in aviation, it's called tombstone technology. In other words, we always have the balance of money. 
And unfortunately, we have had to wait until we had enough people die in an accident to say, you know, we really are going to have to spend the money over here. Atlantic Southeast Airlines Flight 2311 cruises at 15,000 feet. This is Captain Friedland on the flat deck. We've got a bit of weather ahead of us, but we're going to go around it and give you a pretty smooth ride. At the controls of the Embraer 120 is Captain Mark Friedline. He's an experienced pilot with almost 12,000 flight hours. First Officer Hank Johnston has been flying with Atlantic Southeast Airlines for nearly three years. This was a normal day in the life of the crew. Nothing untoward had happened, and uh, I doubt they were expecting any difficulties with the flight. Let's go. 20 degrees to the right. Today's flight is a short commuter route from Atlanta, Georgia, to the city of Brunswick on the Atlantic coast. There are 20 passengers on today's flight. The runway subside. The crew is just five minutes from touching down. ASA 2311, cleared direct to Jeff One. Linco, report the airport in sight. Expect a visual. We do have it in sight, 2311. Slowing for approach speed. The aircraft was normal. There was nothing unexpected. Then the captain notices an unusual sound. It's weird. Number one seems to be spinning faster. The left is, left is pulling a bit more. Bringing power down to the left. Captain Friedline tries to compensate for the plane's unexplained pull to the left. Flight 2311 is less than a thousand feet from the ground, and the plane is getting more and more difficult to control. What's going on? Do you see anything? There's nothing. The crew were apparently caught completely by surprise by something. What's going on with this thing? I can't hold it. Get out of it, Chip! Come on! The plane is dropping out of the sky, and the crew doesn't know why. As Flight 2311 plummets to Earth, Captain Friedline Come on, no. fights desperately to save his plane. It's no use. All 20 passengers and three crew members are killed at the moment of impact. Wreckage is still smoldering when NTSB investigator Jim Ritter arrives at the crash site. Okay, let's start here and work backwards to first impact. I want a record of everything. You need to look at the crash site to collect the physical evidence. That's the most important aspect of any aircraft investigation. At the same time, witnesses tell investigators they saw the plane roll hard to the left before it hit the ground. And it come right over top of the house and it got real loud. It was coming right over these trees here and then it got extra loud. We knew that it was some kind of very abrupt failure that would have been difficult for the flight crew to overcome. What could make it roll so far over? As investigators scour the wreckage, searching for clues, Ritter knows they'll be working without any onboard flight recorders. In 1991, commuter planes aren't required to carry them. Without the black boxes, it's basically a process of elimination. We analyze all of the physical evidence and come up with the most compelling scenario that matches that evidence. So far, the investigator's best clue is the steep left roll before impact. When the airplane rolled to the left, it could really only be due to two things. Perhaps the pilot wanted to roll to the left, or there was a malfunction that the pilots couldn't counteract. 
But when investigators study the engines, they find that they were operating normally at the moment of impact. Ritter turns his attention to the other main part of the plane's propulsion system. Let's take a look at these propellers. When we started doing testing the propeller system, we didn't know it was going to lead us, but it was something we had to eliminate, if nothing else. Deep inside the propeller unit, investigators uncover an important clue. Aha! There you are. We have a witness mark. Take a look. There's a small mark where the base of the propeller slammed into its housing during the crash. It might be enough to tell investigators how the propellers were operating at the moment of impact. You can literally match up the scratch marks between both pieces, and you'll know what the angle of the propeller blade was from that measurement. So mark this one, 22 degrees. The Embraer 120 has what's called a constant speed propeller. The blades spin at a steady rate in flight. When the pilots need more power, the blades twist, changing their angle to take a bigger bite out of the air and provide more thrust. Slow in for approach speed. And in flight, it acts like the automatic transmission in a car. It's as if it's changing gears to match the engine load. The marks tell Ritter the exact angle of the blades when the plane slammed into the ground. We immediately noticed the difference between some of the blade angle measurements for the left engine versus the right engine. The blades were almost flat. At three degrees, the blades are so flat they would act like a wall, blocking the flow of air the plane needs to maintain lift. It might have caused the pilots to lose control. Investigators study the mechanism used to control the left propeller. Will you look at this? It's completely worn down. The teeth on a key gear mechanism, known as the quill, are almost entirely worn away. This is what it's supposed to look like. With its teeth worn away, the quill can't effectively lock onto the gear system that controls the angle of the propeller blades. That really was a eureka moment for us because now we had a serious malfunction that we could examine. Investigators study the design of the propeller mechanism. They learned that shortly before the accident, the propeller manufacturer started using a harder, more abrasive coating on a key part known as the transfer tube, which meshes with the quill teeth. He turned it into a giant file. So the splines on the transfer tube were much harder and rougher than the quill teeth, and it was almost like sandpaper, so the tube was actually wearing down the teeth on the quill. Investigators now understand why the quill teeth were worn down. Without functional quill teeth, the propeller blades could slip into a dangerously flat position. To prove their new theory, investigators need to take a huge risk. We've got to see what happens in the air. And test the damaged propeller system under full flight conditions. I said, well, the only way to really know is let's do a flight test and find out. Because we are at a point in investigation, we need to start eliminating things. The investigation into the crash of Flight 2311 moves to Embraer headquarters in Brazil. Investigator Tom Houter meets with the representatives from Embraer and the propeller manufacturer. Thank you for doing this. Embraer's chief test pilot, Gilberto Schettini, will fly an Embraer 120 that has been modified to recreate the failure of Flight 2311. So we've modified the quill. The teeth have been worn down, just like Flight 2311. A worn quill is placed inside the propeller unit. 
this was potentially very high risk because once we disconnected the transfer tube in flight, the pilots would have no way to control the propeller. We put a pitch lock here. It won't go past 22 degrees. A mechanical lock has also been added to stop the propeller from going flatter than 22 degrees, not three degrees as happened on flight 2311. It would be too dangerous in the flight test to have the propeller blade go all the way to flat pitch. You'd lose control of the airplane. That was almost guaranteed. The MB120, do you copy? What if this airplane crashes? What if we lose the airplane? I'm the one you know, who's basically running this test. Uh, this could be all my responsibility. Copy. We are ready to disengage the prop. Propeller blade angles causing no problems? No control issues. Then the Brazilian test flight takes a dramatic turn. As the flight continues, the blades begin drifting towards the deadly flat position. Reducing speed. Easy does it. We started feeling a rolling moment to the left and uh, your moment to the left. The blades go as flat as this test will allow. For Hauter, the risky test flight has paid off. The investigator's theory about the crash is back on solid ground. Seeing the data right then, it took a load off, so it came, wow. <laughs> I mean, we now know what happened. It was obvious. Investigators finally understand the full story behind the crash of Flight 2311. When the flight crew began preparations for landing, the teeth on the quill were worn down, still operational. Slowing for approach speed. Preparing for landing put renewed pressure on the already worn teeth in the quill. The teeth could no longer stay locked on the left propeller mechanism. And once the teeth gave way, the propeller blades were free to drift into a fatally flat position. What's going on with this thing? I can't hold it. The propeller's design couldn't hold the blades at a safe angle, and the plane became less and less controllable. Human error is almost always underneath the causes of an accident, even if it wasn't the pilot or a mechanic. In this particular case, an engineering change was made, which, well-intentioned, actually, did not work out. No! Oh, that's it. Oh, God. Yes. No! The worn quill teeth was a time bomb waiting to go off. After the accident, additional safeguards are added to prevent this type of failure, a change that affects not only Embraer, but several other turboprop aircraft. Airline manufacturers are constantly trying to stay ahead of potentially fatal design flaws. Air crash investigators are determined to make sure they do. What's important is getting to the truth. So if the truth is something that may hurt the company, let the chips fall where they may. <laughs> 